thank you for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak. So today I'll be talking about LP non-bound holomorphic forms. Um, and I should emphasize that uh, everything I'll be talking about is uh, joint work with Rizwan Khan from the University of Mississippi. All right, so uh, the general setup of the problem interested is looking at eigenfunctions of Laplacian on a manifold. So we'll take M to be uh, a manifold. We can start with an N-dimensional. Eventually, we just look at surfaces, so two-dimensional manifold. Um, initially, we'll assume this manifold is compact um, and without boundary. So a prototypical example you should have in mind is something like the, the N-sphere, uh, looking at Rn plus 1. And what we want to look at are uh, Laplace and eigenfunctions on this manifold. So these are uh, functions on this manifold that are L2 normalized. So this manifold comes with a natural volume measure. Uh, we want to normalize this, this function such that its L2 norm is equal to one. And we also want it to satisfy the eigenvalue problem, uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator of phi is equal to lambda of phi. So here this Laplace Beltrami operator, well, it's kind of a complicated thing, but we really should just think about how it looks on Rn, which is minus the sum of the second partial derivative. So I'm mean, inserting so this minus here uh, for reasons I'll explain in the next slide. Um, so you can think of this as this differential operator acting on, uh, on a second, uh, on, a, uh, on a function and its eigenvalue is just some uh, complex constant C, which as we shortly see is actually not just uh, some complex constant, but actually a non-negative real number. Okay, so this is a, a second order linear differential operator. And one of the reasons why this is uh, really quite nice is that this second order linear differential operator um, commutes with all the isometries on M. So if you're on RM, isometry just means rotational translation. Um, it's a scalar, scalar differential operator, it's linear, and it's the lowest possible order that uh, commutes with isometries. So it, it's basically the, the simplest such nice operator. All right, so there's a reason why we study these uh, eigenfunctions. And one of the reasons is that, well, uh, they have very many nice properties, such as the fact that the, these eigenfunctions uh, form an orthogonal basis of L2 of M. So this is a Hilbert space. Um, and you have a bunch of functions. And it turns out that if you use look at all of the standard of all these uh, functions, they, they expand this Hilbert space, they form an orthogonal basis. Um, not only that, it, there are countably many such eigenfunctions. Uh, the, the eigenvalues are discrete, uh, the eigenvalues are non-negative, and the eigenvalues form a sequence that uh, tend to infinity. So the fact that the eigenvalues tend to infinity uh, means that we can order these eigenfunctions, the natural ordering of these eigenfunctions, just in terms of increasing eigenvalues. Okay, it's, it's only a partial order because you might have repeated eigenvalues, so you might have two eigenfunctions, the same eigenvalue, there's no natural order there, but still, most of the, uh, up to that, you can still order them and what happens any option. All right, so in general, these eigenfunctions are complicated beasts. There's really not much uh, nice you can say about them in terms of how they look. Um, they're not necessarily going to have closed form solutions. They're just going to be some complicated special function uh, that satisfies this uh, second order linear differential equation. In very special cases, you actually can write down explicitly what these eigenfunctions look like. So the, the two kind of prototypical examples are the sphere or the torus. Um, so if we take, for example, the n torus, then we can explicitly write down what these eigenfunctions look like. And actually really nice, they're basically just waves. They are, so there shouldn't be an i here. There should be sine of two pi times the inner product of, or the dot product of x and y or cosine times two pi of the dot product of x and y. Um, but here, y is, is an n-tuple of integers. So for each n-tuple of integers, I get sine of two pi of the dot product and cosine of two pi of the dot product. These are two different um, solutions to the eigenvalue problem. And the eigenvalue is just four pi squared times the sum of the squares of the entries of this uh, n-tuple of integer, integers y. So if you're a number theorist, you might also already be interested because you see that these eigenvalues are expressed in terms of sums of squares of integers. 
Uh, and indeed, this understanding Laplace and eigenfunctions, Laplace and eigenvalues on the n torus is an interesting from not just an analysis, but in, in, in number theory for this reason. Um, with that being said, I won't really be focusing on the torus much in this talk, except I just want to quickly show you what these eigenfunctions look like. So this is basically a density plot of, of, of what these eigenfunctions look like. And you can see they're basically periodic. Um, so they're, they're periodic, they, they satisfy these nice uh, period relations and the, the densities uh, aren't too complicated. Okay, so as I said before, um, in general, we can't explicitly write what these eigenfunctions look like, uh, except on particularly nice manifolds like the uh, n-torus or the n spin. A more complicated example, but still quite interesting, is the uh, bottom average stadium, which is a complex surface. Okay, it actually has boundaries, so when you're working with this eigenvalue problem, you can add some boundary conditions, but we'll kind of sweep under the rug. And then there are no uh, there are no closed forms for the eigenfunctions, but we can still numerically calculate them. Um, so here's some numerical calculations uh, due, I believe, to Alex Barnett, who looks at these density plots of, of the eigenfunctions. So the darker the graph is, the, the larger the eigenfunction, the lighter, the smaller it is. And each of these um, pictures here is a different density plot for a different Laplacian eigenfunction with increasing eigenvalue. And you can see for the most part, these look pretty random. And okay, there are, there are bits where there are dark bits, but they're, they're not huge clumps of darkness. So these aren't large in most places. They're usually pretty spread out. Except there are some funny examples here, and especially here where um, the Laplacian eigenfunction looks like it's mostly concentrated inside the rectangular part and not concentrated inside the semicircular part. And here it looks like it's completely avoiding the semicircular part and completely concentrated in the uh, rectangular part of this uh, two dimensional manifold with that. Okay, so this is going to come up later in the talk when we look at LP norms. We want to understand where there's concentration of mass and how big an eigenfunction may be. So the case I'm most interested in is the case where uh, these manifolds are actually locally symmetric spaces. And they're locally symmetric spaces coming from, uh, from a group. So you start with a lead group G. You mod out on the right by uh, a maximal compact subgroup of G. And you mod out on the left by a lattice in G. So all you should have in mind uh, when I write this is, is the most, uh, most basic of interesting cases, which is when we take G to be SL2R, so the space of two by two matrices with real entries and determine one, K to be the maximal compact subgroup, which is SO2, and gamma to be the discrete subgroup SL2Z, so the, the modular modular group. So the reason uh, this is interesting is that for, for me, this is interesting is that we'll see that these Laplacian eigenfunctions actually are automorphic forms. All right, so in this case, uh, G mod K, uh, well, with this group modded out by this maximum complex subgroup, and it turns out you can identify this with the upper half plane, so the point Z with the form X plus IY with Y positive. And then um, this, this locally symmetric space is just H mod SL2Z, which is the modular surface. And this has a fundamental domain, um, which I'll, I'll show pictures of in a little bit. Okay, so here is here is a, a bunch of different pictures of the fundamental domain. In each case, there's a Laplacian eigenfunction. So the density plot of Laplacian eigenfunction. So the fundamental domain looks like this, living in the upper half plane. Um, this picture here is a density plot of, of an, a Laplacian eigenfunction on uh, H and SL2Z on the modular surface. And each of these is a different one. So we see they, they all look slightly different, if you, but they have similar patterns. Uh, and you'll notice they look kind of more concentrated down here than up here, but there's a reason for that that we'll see shortly, which is due to the fact that this is a hyperbolic surface. So distances up here aren't compressed as much as distances down here. All right, so let me show you some more pictures. So if I, if I zoom out and show you more, again, we just see some kind of similar things. And if I keep zooming out and look at more Laplacian eigenfunctions. So this is going way further up. We'll see that the further up we go, kind of the, the frequency, the, the wavelength that we're looking at here looks larger. But again, that's just due to the fact that this is a hyperbolic surface. So distances up here aren't as compressed as much as distances down here. All right, so 
these are what the density plots of Laplacian eigenfunctions on the modular surface on HMSL2 that look like. Um, so let me tell you some more about this modular surface. It's a hyperbolic surface, it has negative curvature. Um, it has a hyperbolic metric coming from the upper half plane, um, metric on the upper half plane. Laplacian isn't quite the same as on, um, on R2. So instead of being minus the sum of the second partial derivatives, you have to include this y squared here, and this y squared comes from the fact that um, the, the distance function has a y on the bottom. So this is, is overcoming this distance function and scaling in the vertical direction. And finally, there's a nice uh, volume measure on this uh, modular surface, which just looks like three over pi. This is a normalizing factor to ensure that this is a probability measure, and it's just dx dy over y squared. Okay, so what are these Laplacian eigenfunctions? Well, the Laplacian eigenfunction with eigenvalue zero is just a constant function one. The non-constant Laplacian eigenfunctions um, on, on the modular surface are equivalent to the non-constant Laplacian eigenfunctions on the, on the upper half plane that are invariant by SL2Z. These are known as mass forms or mass cusp forms. Um, so these are, these are a type of automorphic form. And they're closely related to classical holomorphic modular forms. So if you're more comfortable with holomorphic modular forms, wherever you read mass form, you should just think something like a holomorphic modular form. So let me explain why these are similar to holomorphic modular forms. Um, basically, instead of working with Laplacian, as I did before, you can slightly deform the Laplacian. So instead of just having this part here, you include this extra bit here that depends on a weight k. So this isn't uh, quite the same as Laplacian, but similar in many ways. And now, if instead of asking for eigenfunctions of this Laplacian, we ask for eigenfunctions of this weight k Laplacian with this exact eigenvalue here, um, then we essentially get holomorphic modular forms. So actually, you get a holomorphic modular form up to multiplication by y to the k over 2. And once we remove this, then we find that this, uh, this partial differential equation here is, is, is the same thing as the, the Cauchy Riemann equation. So the same thing as ensuring that um, we're working with a holomorphic function. Okay, so these, these are very uh, similar. These, these mass cusp forms, these Laplacian eigenfunctions are very similar to holomorphic modular forms. You'll notice here that the, the eigenvalue for a modular form, a holomorphic modular form is, is kind of like K squared. So you should think of the eigenvalue uh, of a mass cusp form as being similar in some sense to K squared. All right, so here is the fundamental question that I want to uh, ask in this talk, and then I'll, I'll say what we can show towards this. So the fundamental question is, is asking about the distribution of mass of Laplacian eigenfunction, um, or, or rather the sequence of Laplacian eigenfunctions, as we increase, as we increase the eigenvalues, as the eigenvalue tends to increase. Okay, so this question, of course, is a bit vague. There are many ways we interpret what it means uh, to study the distribution of mass. Um, one of the, the but the known ways is to understand this through uh, quantum mediated ergodicity, which I won't discuss. So instead, I'll be talking about LP norms. So uh, I assume you guys have all seen the LP norm before. So you just take your function, you take its absolute value, take it to its peak power, integrate over the whole surface, and then take the peak root from it. And you can do this for any uh, real number greater than this one. Of course, if P, P was infinity, this is just the same thing as the central supremum. Um, and since so by a smooth function, which is the same thing as a supremum. So you can think of this as, in some sense, measuring uh, the, the concentration of mass. So if you take a large P, this is essentially saying how big are the spikes of this function by? How, how big can it get and how much mass does it concentrate in various areas? So um, if you take a large P norm uh, and, and the LP norm is not very big, that means that this does not get too big uh, many times around um, some very steep spikes. If you take a small p norm, this means that it's reasonably spread out and there's, there's no bits where it's, uh, where it's repeatedly uh, larger than it should be. Okay, so I'm gonna study this for Laplacian eigenfunctions. Um, and eventually uh, the main problem we're studying is, is this for uh, uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions in the modular surface, so for, for mass class. So what do we know? Well, we know that when p is equal to two, that by definition, the Laplacian eigenfunction is L2 normalized. So the L2 norm is just equal to one. What about the super norm, the L infinity norm? Well, there's this 
a rather classical result um, coming from something called the local bio law, which tells us that this L infinity norm can't grow faster than the eigenvalue to n minus one over four, where n is the uh, dimension of the manifold. So we're looking at a surface. This says that the L infinity norm grows no quicker than the eigenvalue to one four. There's a nice general uh, way to, to get between these uh, two norms for any p in between here. This is interpolation. Um, you can think of this as like a convexity principle. If you know the L2 norm and the L infinity norm, then you can bound all the LP norms in between um, with an explicit dependence. So in fact, we can show the LP norm uh, for any P between B between uh, between two and infinity is bound by lambda to something that depends on both N and P. Such that when uh, P is equal to two, you just get uh, lambda to the zero, which is one, and P is equal to infinity, you get lambda to, one, to the n minus one before. So this is just interpolating between the L2 norm and the L infinity norm, but you can actually do slightly better. So this is known due to Sog um, in the late 80s. And what he showed, in fact, is that there is another exponent where you can also get a good bound for the LP norm, which is when P is equal to two to the two times n plus one over n minus one. So if n is equal to two, so if n is a surface, this is just the L6 norm. And what he found is you can actually beat what you would get by interpolation for the L6 norm. And then once you have the L6 norm, you can interpolate between the L2 norm and the L6 norm to get LP norm bounds for P between two and six. And you can interpolate between the L6 norm and the unfilling norm to get the remaining bounds. So what he worked out was that the LP norm is bound by lambda to some power and that power uh, varies in these ways. So when n is two, I've, I've graphed this down here. So this is the this is one over p. So when p is two, one over p is a half, and this exponent is just zero. When um, p is infinity, one over p is zero, and the exponent is a quarter. And when p is six, one over p is a, is, uh, is a sixth, and we get this point here. And then we kind of smoothly interpolate between them to get this this curve here. So this is a result of SOG, and you might ask, is this actually, is this result any good? Is this actually something useful? And the answer is yes, because in fact, it's the best you can do for certain manifolds. So if you look at, uh, say, the n-sphere, these LP norm bounds for Laplacian eigenfunctions um, are actually sharp. These are the best you can do. You can actually show that there exist Laplacian eigenfunctions which achieve these LP norm bounds. Okay, but that's for one particular manifold. Um, what happens if you if you impose conditions on your manifold? So, for example, if you ask your man, if your manifold has say non-positive curvature, obviously the sphere is positively curved. If you have non-positive curvature, you can actually improve these bounds. You can you can get logarithmic savings. Um, so you can save by some power of log lambda. And if uh, you take something completely flat like the torus. So if you take the two torus, for example, it's known that the LP norm is in fact uniformly bounded for P between two and four. And more generally for the N torus, we don't know it's uniformly bounded, but we only lose by a very small power of, of uh, the eigenvalue if P is between two and two N over N minus one. Okay, so here you can see that the actually, well, the LP norms um, can't, these bounds can't be improved in the, on the sphere. But they can be improved on negatively or non positively curved surfaces or flat surfaces like the torus. So there's a general conjecture due to Vanyat and, and Sarnak. Um, uh, I guess it's, it's written down explicitly in a survey of Sarnak from nine, uh, 2003, which says if that you're working on a compact surface, so two dimensional manifold, that's negatively curved, but not only is its, its LP norm, not only do you get this logarithmic savings, but in fact, you should have something that's essentially uniformly bounded. The, the LP norm should grow no faster than the eigenvalue to the epsilon, no matter which P you choose. So this is saying that, that SOG's bounds are very far off the truth. SOG um, says that you have these polynomial growth in the eigenvalue. This conjecture of variance in science says, well, actually, you really should have something that grows as, as slowly as possible. So this is a really strong conjecture. This is this is really quite optimistic. And one of the reasons is if you take um, your comic surface to be certain arithmetic surfaces and you, you take special point on that surface, 
Well, these, these values of these Laplace eigenfunctions are actually related to special values of L functions. And this would, uh, this would show that these special values of L functions are quite small. Uh, so it shows something for the generalized Lindelof hypothesis, which is the, the conjecture that the central value of, of an L function or of an automatic form um, grows no quicker than its analytic conductor to the epsilon for every epsilon. So this generalized Lindelof hypothesis, which I'll abbreviate to GLH, this, um, this is implied by the generalized Riemann hypothesis, but certainly not known unconditioned. So it, in some sense, it's a proxy for the generalized Riemann hypothesis. It's a really strong rigid conjecture that we all believe is true, but is very far out of reach right now. So Vyach's incise conjecture implies this GLH in certain cases, so it's an extremely strong conjecture. Okay, so what's known towards this conjecture? So this conjecture for negatively curved compact surfaces. Um, we'll work with something non-compact. So we'll work with the, the modular surface, which is non-compact but has finite volume. Um, and what I've had shown uh, 27 years ago is that in fact, well, we don't get all the way down to eigenvalues of the epsilon. But we do get a power savings improvement on Sog's band. So Sog showed that the soup norm is bounded by the eigenvalues one quarter. And the balance and sonic get a power savings. They save, they shave off one over 24 in the next one. So you can think of this as a sub convex bound with super norm. Okay, once you have this, you can interpolate between this super norm bound, the L2 norm bound, and you get this graph here. Um, the fact that this surface is non-compact means we can't just use sub results. So you can't use this L6 norm result that he uses because that only works for compact purposes, although you could probably modify his method um, to show something similar. I should also mention that I may uh, add something. <coughs> yes. Uh, you are in the formula group, so take uh, uh, eigenfunctions automatically there. But in ge more general you need you need hacker operators to bring Yeah, to, yeah. So I'm swinging under a rug, but yeah to crash it's pointing out that, that, um, yeah. that I need to assume these these mask cusp forms not just cusp forms, there are also eigenfunctions of every single head of head of So need these to be arithmetic eigenfunctions. Um, okay, the fact that M is non-compact surprisingly means that, um, that this previous conjecture about the LP norms being found by eigenvalues the epsilon, that can't hold the non-compact surfaces. It's just phenomenon known as essentially as escape of mass at the cusp. These eigenfunctions grow quite quickly at the cusp, um, but we, we won't really worry about that. Okay, so this, this nice result of, of the Vanian and Sonic, which proves this power savings for the L infinity norm. And the question that I'm going to study in the rest of the talk is whether we can prove this when P is smaller. So we have this, this, this result of the L infinity norm. Uh, it uses the amplified free trace formula. Um, it really uses the arithmetic nature of this, of this modular surface and of these eigenfunctions. Um, but the method only works for the L infinity. So there's nothing about other LP norms. So can you improve this for small p? Um, and in um, Thomas Watson's PhD thesis in 2002, he showed the answer is yes, when p is equal to four, um, conditionally on the generalized limit of hypothesis. So again, I'm assuming these, these eigenfunctions are eigenfunctions or head operators. And he looked at the L4 norm, and he showed that if you assume GLH, you do get this uh, Avani at Sonic conjecture. It's bound by eigenvalues of the epsilon. And then once you have that, you can interpolate um, between L2 and L4 and L4 and L3. Okay, so this is nice. It's a really quite strong result, um, but it's conditional on GLH. And it turns out you can actually hope for something even better, which is uh, something known as the Gaussian moments conjecture. So this is uh, Essentially goes back to Berry. I don't know if this conjecture is written down anywhere. Um, nice. The conjecture states that if you take M to be a negatively curved surface, so not just non-positive physics, but negative curvature, um, and you look at the, the nth moment of an eigenfunction. So you look at its integral, you look at its nth moment, this should converge to the nth moment of a Gaussian random variable. So these Laplacian eigenfunctions should behave, the distribution should be the same as the distribution of a Gaussian random. This is a very optimistic conjecture. This is, uh, this is really quite hopeful. Um, 
you notice that if n is odd, the right-hand side vanishes. So we conjecture that if n is odd, these, these moments uh, vanish. And if n is even, you're taking this, the square of this, and this is something that's real, so the square is positive. So it's the same thing as taking the, the ln norm when n is an even integer. So in particular, if, if n is four, this conjecture states that the, the, the L4 norm raised to the fourth power should be should converge to the fourth moment of a Gaussian random variable, which is equal to three. In fact, this is known if we assume generalizing the So this was a result of uh, Jack Putney and my co-author, uh, Rizwan Khan, uh, five years ago. They, they, in fact, improved this L4 norm bound of Watson to an asymptotic. So they showed that this L4 norm, once raised to the fourth power, converges to three with a, with a little power series error. And subsequently, um, Rizwan Khan and I proved this result unconditionally for a special subsequence of orthogonal functions. So a thin subsequence of eigenfunctions or dihedral uh, eigenfunctions or dihedral, uh, dihedral mass cusp forms or CM mass cusp forms. Um, unconditionally, we can prove this asymptotic, but that is a thin subsequence of the partial eigenfunctions. So we have to have, this is only um, the eigenvalue tending to infinity along this subsequence of Okay, so this is much stronger than than what um, than what uh, what what's improved because we're actually an asymptote, not just uh, an upper bound. Okay, so I should uh, quickly mention uh, before I move on that these kinds of problems have been studied in many aspects. So I'm, I'm posing all these questions for mass cusp forms, so partial eigenfunctions on the modular surface. But as I mentioned earlier, these kinds of things are very similar to holomorphic modular forms. So you can still ask the same questions for LP norm bounds of holomorphic modular forms in the weight aspect. So as the weight K tends to infinity, how large are these LP norm bounds of um, holomorphic modular forms? Okay, so you need to actually multiply them by the imaginary part of Z to the K over two to make sure this, uh, this thing is holomorphic, this makes sense. Um, then, so we have some, some nice other bounds due to Geo okay, in 2007, where it shows that this super norm Grows essentially like K to one over four. There is an unconditional bound for the L4 norm. So this is kind of um, this is an unconditional analog of what's in this result. Uh, but we showed the L4 norm in this holomorphic module form in the weight aspect um, grows no faster than K to one over 12. Uh, and if you assume the generalized Remy hypothesis, then you can prove something much stronger. You can show this L4 norm is uniformly bounded. So it grows no faster than the constant. This is a very recent result from last week here by Peter Sands. You can also look at these same problems in the level aspect. So you can think of sequences of um, mass cusp forms or holomorphic, modu holomorphic modular forms of increasing level. Uh, and it turns out there are, there are kind of two different ways to look at this. Is one if you let Q, the level Q tends to infinity along square free um, integers. Then you get this L infinity norm bound. If you like Q to infinity long prime powers, you get an analog of the Van and Sinax result. And there are various hybrid results where, where Q uh, may just be any integer, and then there's some dependence on, on various powers. So it gets a bit complicated to assume that Q is not purely square free or Q is not purely a prime power. Um, and there's lots of variants of these problems. Uh, and you can also look at this. The, these LP norms, um, for example, the L4 norm uh, in the level aspect. And so there's work of, of Rizwan Khan and again, Chat Fatkin. And finally, you can look at these problems on average. So if you look at the L4 norm on average, you can show bounds that are essentially, essentially sharp. Okay, so these are, this is a, a very active area of research. There are a lot of people thinking about um, LP norms, especially L and P norm and the L4 norm, because you have two good strategies in each of those cases. So what I want to discuss today is um, some work that uh, Rizwan Khan and I have been working on. Um, you should take this with a pinch of salt because we're still writing these up. So uh, things are not yet complete and these exponents may change. Um, this question, do we not care about P less than two? Um, I guess we do care about P less than two, um, but the problem is you, you have nothing to interpolate with. So you can get lower bounds LP norms with P between one and two, but 
you can't interpolate uh, upper bounds because you have no upper bound for the L at the L1 norm that is in any way non-trivial. So basically, the techniques go out the window for for P less than two. Okay, so this this is uh, a result that um, Rizwan Khan and I improved, which is that for Laplace and eigenfunctions, the modular surface, the arithmetic eigenfunctions, so the the eigenfunctions of all the Heck operators, um, we get an improvement over what Sol gives us um, by a quite large amount. So Sol tells us that the L4 norm is bounded by eigenvalue point over 16, and we improve this by a little over a, a six-fold. Um, we get three to three over four. Uh, three. So Sol's bound is, is something up here, and we get something that's more than a six-fold improvement. Okay, once we have this, um, we can interpolate between the L2 norm being equal to one and the, the infinity, L infinity norm bound of the Byington Sonic. And so now we get something that beats Sog's bounds for all P. So Sog bounds are these red, red line, Byington and Sonic is this blue line. If we combine Byington and Sonic and what um, Khan and I get, we get this green line that beats um, Sog's bound everywhere by power uh, And the nice thing about this is that it's unconditional. So, of course, we, we know under the generalized Lindelof hypothesis that we can get all the way down to zero here, um, P is four, um, but that's conditional. So this is an unconditional result. I have a question. Uh, didn't yes. Simon, hi, very nice. Uh, yep. um, didn't Simon Marshall do something on this? So Simon, yeah, that, that's a good point. I didn't mention here. Simon um, had this paper in June that I was actually skimming this morning uh, from seven years ago, where he looked at, uh, uh, L2 norm bounds for geodesic restrictions and got a subconvex bound for that. And then he used some work of Bougain, I think it was Bougain, to show that this implies subconvex bounds for the L4 norm um, for compact arithmetic surfaces, from surfaces coming from um, returning molecules. I don't, maybe you could push this method to work for non compact. I, I don't know how to ask. Um, it's a much smaller power set. So if you look at here, you oh, can yeah, guess, right. like, a one over 56 improvement yeah. over, over um, Sog's bin. So it's, it's a very small improvement. Agreed. Thanks. Okay, so in the last uh, bit of the talk, the remaining bit of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we prove this. Um, so the strategy, the initial portion of the strategy is, is uh, goes back 20 years um, to Watson's thesis. I'm, I'm guessing uh, Peter Sonic is the, in fact, the person who suggested this strategy to to uh, Watson, who was his, Watson was his PhD student. Um, so the strategy is, is the fact we all look at this L4 norm. Okay, we can just look at the, the fourth power of the L4 norm. So we remove the fourth root. So looking at this integral of phi to the four, which is the same thing as the inner product of phi squared with itself. And then we have this inner product of a function and another function. And now we can use Parseval's identity to expand this as a sum over an orthogonal basis of L2 of n. And the nice thing about this is that when we expectfully expand it, well, we mentioned at the beginning of the talk that Laplace and eigenfunctions themselves form an orthogonal basis of L2 of n. So our spectral expansion here, expansion using Pascal's identity, is in terms of Laplace and eigenfunctions themselves, just different. So we have the constant eigenfunction one, and then we have a sum over all the Laplace and eigenfunctions um, psi, of the inner product squared of phi squared against the side. Okay, I'm sweeping under the rug here that this is a non complex surface, so that there's also a contribution from the continuous spectrum involving Eisenstein series. Um, but for the sake of this talk, we'll just pretend those don't. They, they don't add any complication. Okay, so the first term is just to expect to expand this. And now we've reduced the problem to understanding how large this sum of this triple product here is. So a triple product, I mean the integral of phi squared against another Laplacian eigenfunction psi. And what, what's been shown in this thesis is that, is that we can relate this triple product to special values of L functions. And once we do that, we can actually show that these terms here um, decay exponentially once psi is large. So once, um, once Laplacian eigenfunction of psi is sufficiently large to get Laplacian eigenfunction. Bye. All right, so let's see what this is. So there's, this is the identity that uh, relates L functions, uh, these triple products to L functions. 
disappeared and what's in stasis and then it was fleshed out in by generality by Ichino uh, a few weeks later. And it states that this triple product of the square of a Laplacian eigenfunction against another Laplacian eigenfunction is exactly equal up to some explicit constant um, of this quotient of special values of L functions. So this is an L function, a value of the central point, L functions evaluate the edge of the proof strip. And these are completed L functions. So lambda means I'm including the gamma factor. Okay, the fact that it has gamma factors isn't an issue because we can explicitly write down what these gamma factors look like and then use Sterling's formula to understand the size of these gamma factors. It turns out to be easy to understand the size by relating them to um, the square roots of the eigenvalue. So I'll write T psi for the square root of uh, lambda psi uh, minus a quarter and T phi for the square root of lambda phi minus a quarter. And it turns out this special value of L functions is exactly equal to some constant times some gamma functions times the, the L functions themselves. And these gamma functions have a certain asymptotic behavior. So the first thing you notice is, is that if the spectral parameter of psi is larger than twice the spectral parameter of phi, this thing decays exponentially. And so as I said in the previous slide, this means that we can truncate this sum due to this exponential decay. So it's really a finite sum rather than an infinite sum. The second thing is that we have some Delicate polynomial dependence on these spectral parameters. So it decays polynomial, polynomially in, in T psi. And then there's some polynomial dependence on T phi and T psi that changes when these spectral parameters are close. So if, if T psi is closer to T phi, then this decay goes away and otherwise it exists. Okay, the upshot of this is that we can truncate the spectral sum and we can show this the fourth power of the L4 norm is essentially bounded by one plus this finite sum times the special values of L functions weighted by this complicated polynomial dependence. And the rest of the game is to understand this sum of L functions. So this is a mixed moment of L functions. There's two different L functions in here. That's with a complicated weight. And understanding moments of L functions is, is kind of a very well studied problem in analytic quantum theory. So the, the most classical version of this is understanding moments of the ring and zeta function, problems like this. So you can think of this as a discrete analog. So it's a, it's a sum instead of an integral, and these are more complicated L functions. But it's a similar problem to understanding moments of the ring and zeta function. Um, with the additional complication that it's a hybrid problem, it actually makes this problem quite hard. My hybrid, I mean, well, here, our only parameter, so we're fixing some case, that's how high a moment is. And parameter is t. We want to understand how big this, this moment of the ring zero function is in the t aspect. But here, our moment depends delicately. Well, its length depends on phi, so we're summing over t psi. And these L functions depend delicately on both t psi and t phi, so on, on both spectral parameters. So the length of the sum depend, depends on on T phi and the conductor of these L functions, the complexity of these L functions depends on both of these. So it's a somewhat hybrid problem that we have these two parameters to worry about. Okay, so uh, I'll mention here what's known about the spectral sum. So I'm just going to admit what's inside the brackets because it's complicated. So a strategy for bounding the spectral sum is to break it up into three parts. And the reason we're breaking it up into three parts is if I go back to this slide uh, here, you notice that this term here depends delicately on how close T psi is to 2 T phi. So what's, like in, what's noticed uh, almost 20 years ago is that the initial portion when T psi is somewhat smaller than T phi um, looks negligible so long as we assume the generalized normal hypothesis. And the same thing goes if, if that T psi um, is on the other side of this, this bit, so it's not too close to, it's not, um, it's quite close to 2, two T phi and it's a quite short. So they show that they, they show that these two contributions are very small under, under the, the assumption of generalized limiting hypothesis. And the main contribution seems to come from when T psi is reasonably close to 2 T phi. And this range where T psi is reasonably close to 2 T phi, they were actually able to show uh, a bound unconditionally for this portion of the spectral sum. Um, using techniques like the, the GL3 Voronoi summation formula, 
which had just been thought, formulated in uh, Stephen D. Miller's PhD thesis. Okay, so what they've shown is the main contribution seems to come from here. They could bound this quite well. And these two terms, at least under GLH, uh, seem to be negligibly small. And you might hope to be done here because this bit uh, looks like to be like the main bit and these terms here should be small. And we've shown that the main bit actually isn't too large. So you would assume that it means the small bits should be able to be shown to be small. But somewhat surprisingly, um, and something that wasn't noticed for a while is that it's actually quite hard to unconditionally show that these bits that should be small genuinely are small. So what Sayak and Watson show is that we just need to show that these two terms here, which we know are small conditionally, are actually small unconditionally. Uh, if I may interrupt, since this might be a good occasion for me to confess something. <laughs> I think Peter knows what I'm going to confess. So uh, in my BAMS notes uh, lectures, I think from 2004, there's a claim that Watson and I are going to prove uh, unconditionally, the L4 norm is uh, bounded by lambda to the epsilon, and uh, that uh, is withdrawn. It did so. Uh, I think I've said it enough times around the world, but since you're recording this, it's now on record. Uh, sorry to disturb you, but I think the record should be st set straight, and uh, I'm setting it straight. I'm the, I'm the person who's the culprit. Yeah, I was I was tactfully skirting around that claim. Because this, this bit here, you actually could show, um, but these bits here, yeah, I think that's fine. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna be treating this bit, how we can actually unconditionally attack this first range. I'm not gonna worry about the second range. Um, there are similar techniques. But. So this first range is, is, is the hard bit, it turns out. This bit looks like it should be hard, but it's actually easy. All right, so we wanna attack this, this sum here where um, T psi is a fair bit smaller than T. So we've shown, well, we can just break this up into dyadic regimes. We know the size of the weight in these dyadic regimes. We have this moment of L functions. And we want to show is that once we're broken this up into dyadic regimes, well, T is smaller than T phi. Uh, these are the weights at the front. We want to show that this moment of L functions is bounded by one. And if we assume the generalizing the left this is certainly true. This, this, this term is like not just less than one, it's less than T over T phi. So here, capital T is my dyadic kind of that goes up to T phi. Okay, so we know how to bound this uh, conditionally, and the, the problem is how to bound this unconditionally. So that this is quite hard, and the reason it's quite hard is that um, this L function is quite complicated analytically that has a large analytic conductor relative to the range, to the, the length of this sum. We're good at bounding moments when the analytic conductor is not so large can make the length, but this is a short sum with large analytic conductor, and that's a very hard problem. Is it known that central values are non-negative? Yes, it is known that central values are non-negative. That's a key thing we're going to use. So we know that these numbers are both greater than or equal to zero, which is not a priority obvious. All right, so how do we bound this? Uh, we're going to have three strategies, which I'll talk you through. The first is, is simply using the, the, the cauchy schwarz inequality and the spectral love sib inequality due to Desvier invariance. The second is a little trickier using holders in the quality and then try to understand just the first moment of this L value here. And the third is a technique known as GL4 plus GL2 spectral reciprocity. Okay, so the first is quite straightforward. We have this sum of the product of these two things and we just Cauchy Schwartz to separate them. And then once we separate them, we replace these L functions with Dirichlet formula. So this is a kind of standard technique in analytic number theory. You have a central value of an L function. You can replace it by a Dirichlet polynomial. The length of the Dirichlet polynomial depends on the length on the analytic conductor. Then we have a Dirichlet, we have a Dirichlet polynomial here and a sum here. And there is a technique to the variance and, and Desvier that gives us a really nice way of, of bounding these sums of Dirichlet polynomials. So we do this, we use the second known as a special large sieve once we've separated these things. And we end up being able to show that this sum is less than t to the three halves times t phi. And what we were trying to show is that it's no larger than t times t phi. So we're losing by t to the half, and this can be quite drastically bad because t is running all the way up to uh, t phi. 
So the reason why this is bad is that this L function isn't so complicated. This L function is quite bad. And this is a big analytic conductor. This is a short length. So it, it's not a great trade. What's interesting is that if we just use this technique alone and don't do anything else, we recover something. So we get back what's on. Okay, so that's the first strategy. It, it's quite lossy. In fact, it's very lossy when um, uh, diet comma T gets quite close to T prime. The second strategy is to use, as, as Henrik mentioned, the fact that these L values are non-negative and just use the super norm bound for this L value here and pull it out the front. So we know a subconvex bound. We know that this special value grows no quicker than T to the one third. And so we just pull that T to the one third at the front. And we know that this thing here is non-negative, so we don't have to worry about absolute values. And we are left with bounding this sum. Okay, this is fitting some stuff in the right. I actually use all this inequality in a more fancy way, um, but this is uh, fine for the purpose of this talk. And Rob Rizwan and I would have shown, which is, is, is um, quite new and at least wasn't at all obvious to us, is that when we have this L function here alone, we can actually explicitly write out this out in terms of something else. We can write this out as a main term of size t squared, which is what you'd expect under the general algorithm hypothesis. So conjecturally, this is really actually how big this thing is, plus a dual term. And the dual term is kind of surprising that the dual term is equal to an integral of a different uh, collection of L functions. So this, we started with um, a GL2 moment, so we're summing over GL2 modular forms or mass forms of a GL3 times GL2 ranking server L function. And we end up with a GL1 moment, so an integral over T, of a GL4 cross GL1 L function. This is a GL1, this is a GL3 times GL1, so it's kind of a, a GL4 object. This turns out to be a generalization of a, a formula known as Morihashi's formula, which relates the fourth moment of the Riemann zeta function to the cubic moment of, uh, of central values of L functions associated to modular forms. There's also a similar result due to Conrin and Varnietz on the cubic moment of um, central values of L functions of automorphic forms related to the fourth moment of theoretically L functions. This is essentially a cusp of analog. What's interesting is we actually prove an exact identity. So I'm writing an approachable form. We actually show this is exactly equal to this plus a dual term weighted by some function. Okay, so once we have this, well, we have a nice strategy, which is we want to understand how to bound this. So we just need to understand how to bound this dual moment here. And we do that by, by Cauchy scores. We just separate out these two L functions. We separate out you know, the square of this, this Riemann zeta function, you know, the square of this special value of this L function, and we're integrating over them. And then we do the same kind of thing before, which is we play, replace them by Dirichlet L functions. And then we can use this trick of large sieve that we have a second moment of Dirichlet L functions integrated. We have nice ways to balance. They'll skip everything we get. We end up with some complicated bounds here. Um, again, this is a bit lossy because this L function here is a bit long compared to the integral we're integrating over. But we get something that's um, decent. It's better than the previous bounds we got um, when T is a bit closer to T prime. Remember, our previous bounds are really bad as soon as our, our data kind of T was somewhat large. These are much better when T is somewhat large. They're actually worse when T is quite small. All right, so those are the, the two strategies. And the third and final strategy is something similar. So in the second strategy, I pulled out this L value at the front, and I showed that once I remove this L value, I'm left with just this L function here. And it's exactly equal to a main term plus a dual moment, which is um, something similar, um, except with different L functions and a different length. So I start with a sum and I end up with an integral. A third approach doesn't take out this L value at all at the front. We don't bound this. We just start with this sum and we don't uh, try to use any, we don't use quotient sorts, we don't use whole or anything, but we use some other arithmetic techniques like uh, the Kuznetsov formula and Voronoi summation formula and uh, the spectral expansion of sums of cosmic sums. And what we're able to show is that this special value, this, this moment of L functions 
is exactly equal to a main term, which has size t squared, which is what we would expect under generalized new hypothesis, plus a dual term, which is another moment of L function. And what's interesting is that this is, is similar to what we saw last time. We start with a moment of L functions and we end up with a main term plus a different moment of L functions. But here we actually end up with the same moment of L function, just weighted differently and of a different length. So initially this was weighted by one and now it's weighted by t squared over t prime. And initially this was of length t and now it's of length t phi over t. This is quite surprising. This is, this is not completely obvious. Um, is it this we, surprising? Is it, is it what, that's what you call uh, reciprocity? Yeah, so this, this um, you can think of this as a generalization of, a, of Kuznetsov's and Amodahashi's formula for the fourth moment of the central value of a, of a Heckenmaas class form. So they show that you have this kind of duality formula that if you look at the fourth moment, it's, it's equal to the, the same fourth moment with a different weight. What, what was uh, Valentin Blomer? Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's also work of Valentin Blomer and, and your PhD student, Zhao Ching Li, and um, your colleague, Stephen D. Miller, who looked at a GL4 plus GL2 moment. So the kind of cuspidal version of this, where this does not factorize. They uh, saw something similar, except they they were thinking of T phi as being fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so you, we call this spectral reciprocity because it, it it relates one moment of L functions to a different moment of L functions. It's, it's spectral sum to a different spectral sum. Um, so there's it reminds me in that sense. more uh, the approximate function equation rather than the reciprocity, but. Well, we, we don't Up use a functional equations it, at all. It's, it's your product. This, this doesn't use approximate functional equations at all. I mean, the, the, the switching the lengths according to yeah, the, I, yeah, I guess you can think of that in some sense as being like the approximate functional equation where you can vary the length. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Gary you, you have, you have yeah. exact identity over there, just simply a size of it. So it's, it's an exact identity. Mm -hmm. So we have a test function here. So instead of this, this diagram, we actually have a test function here, and we have a different test function here. And we can, mm -hmm. it, it's related in terms of uh, um, hypergeometric functions. And we just bound them. But it's an exact identity. It's not an approximate one. Uh, yes, F should be psi. Sorry, Matt. That's uh, that's five ways. Uh, question from Gyori. Did you have your hand raised? No? Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so this, sorry, this, this, this F should be a psi. Okay, so this is a, a generalization of an identity of this net solve that relates this GL2 moment um, of this thing to the same GL2 moment, but way differently. And I said so this is a, a reciprocity formula. Um, and this kind of thing has been studied recently by Loma Lee and Wong. And the reason why this is a good strategy is that. We started in, in some range here and we ended up in a different range. And a priori that, that's bad because we selected down this moment of L functions. But the good thing about it is that we already know how to do that because we have our first and second strategies. So that means if that T is say larger than T phi to one half, we want to bound this moment, we switch it. Now we end up with the sum that something of, of size less than T phi to one half. And we already have strategies. So this, this is why the third trade comes after the first and second, is because the third strategy reduces us to a moment that we can now bound, bound by the first and second, second strategies. Okay, so we combine these three strategies. Um, we can use some additional tricks as well using holism quality that I'm not going to go into, but using things like the 12th moment of, of special values of L functions and various other things. Um, we can show you that what we wanted to show is that this moment here. Um, Matt asked, do you get the silicon weights on the dual side? Kind of. Um, we haven't actually looked at the silicon nature of them. I would assume they're somewhat the silicon. We're just bounding them in absolute value. We have to kind of delicately bound them in absolute value. Um, I, I doubt you can take any advantage whatsoever of, of any oscillatory nature of, of, of the, the dual side. Um, okay, so what we were trying to show is we're trying to show that. The initial portion of the spectral sum, so we broke up the diac regimes, which was basically the same thing as one over t times t phi, especially at L functions. 
We're trying to show that this is bounded by a constant if t is the low of t side. And if we combine these three strategies, we're able to show that for most ranges of our Gaia parameter t, um, except when t is particularly small. So if t is less than t pi to 3 over 19, the best we can do is this first strategy. That first strategy loses, loses by t to the half. So instead of bounding this by, by 1, we bound this by t to the half. And if you plug in t is equal to t phi to 3 of 19, we get uh, t phi to the 3 of 38. And that means that this, the fourth power of the L4 norm is bound by t phi to the 3 of 38, where t phi is basically the square root of lambda. So if we take fourth roots and place this by the square root of lambda, we get the uh, L4 norm is bound by 3 to the 3 of 4. Okay, so I'll stop there. Uh,